lovely to be with you. Um, I'm both flattered and honoured. Um, I, I always get slightly scared of the, of the publisher's puff, and I, I don't feel anything like as good as that makes me sound. So I shall now be um, a, a little bit nervous, I think, as I carry on, uh, just to, to get myself back into the frame of mind and, and, and confident. However, I am going to talk to you about Roman London, um, and it's something I have been gently obsessed with for an awful long time. Uh, it's, it's taken there on a school trip when I was not even in my teens, um, and it stayed with me ever since. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing screen, and this is where you have to shout, or somebody has to shout if you don't see what I see, but this should be my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, Perfect. Good to meet. See that. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and that is, of course, where we're talking about. It is the city of London. Uh, Roman London carries on both sides of the river. We have some very exciting stuff in Southwark, as, as those of you who read the newspapers today will be, be hearing. Um, but the core of our interest is the city of London and its relationship with the River Thames and how the Romans developed a city here. And what I'm really going to be talking about is empire and city, uh, how Rome was served by building its new administrative uh, and trading centre here on the Thames. And it's a story of ups and downs. Uh, it's a long story. I think what people tend to think of the Roman period as the Roman period. But we're, we're looking at nearly four centuries uh, of, of history here. And it changes remarkably during that period of time. And quite how on earth I'm going to squeeze in over the next 40 minutes uh, such a, a chunk of history. Uh, well, we'll see. I'm going to give it a go. And if I have to rush a bit at the end, forgive, but I will dwell a bit more on the early stuff and, and the stuff at the end we can always take forward in questions if I don't quite get through it. Um, so there, there we have our subject, the city, uh, framed by the Tower of London uh, in the bottom left and going up uh, to Blackfriars Bridge where the Fleet River used to be at the top, set over two hills uh, that occupied the north bank of the River Thames, and as I said, extending across into Southwark uh, as a suburb, a satellite site on the south bank. Um, there we go. That's just why I'm here. I'm plugging a book, but I shall uh, do so again at the end of this. It's a thick book. It covers an awful lot of ground, and the purpose of this chat is to give you a quick in and save you having to read all of it, although I'm sure my publishers would love you to want to read all of it. Um, what we've got in the city is this enormous metropolis, this modern day city where people build a lot. And that has given us 400 years odd of discovery underneath building sites in the city, uh, going all the way back into the 1580s. And the pace of that building work has really picked up post-war reconstruction. Here, of course, is the Temple of Mithras being excavated by uh, Professor Grimes in the 1950s. This is actually the scene a year before my birth. Um, and it's pretty much where I come in in every sense is it was the Temple of Mithras that I was taken on my school trip to visit and that excited me most. But it is the volume of work that's gone on in the city that makes this a really exceptional archeological site and gives us the stuff from which we can start to write new histories of the Roman world. Uh, the figures are enormous, thousands of excavations, uh, millions of stratified finds assemblages. And most important of all, from my point of view, is our tree ring dating. Dendrochronology is the most stunning tool. London was built with timber piles beneath most of its public buildings, with timber lined drains, with timber waterfronts and revetments. And the volume of timber needed in London meant that it was being felled on demand. And we know it was used green, it doesn't have the cracks and shakes of, of seasoned timber. And the dates we can get from it are to the season of the year. We know when procurement exercises are happening for building in London. And when you've got more than a thousand precisely dated construction activities going on in London, this changes it from being the archeology span of eras and epochs and makes it into an archeology span that talks about specific dates. Things happen in particular years. And what's fascinating about that is if you're brave enough, you can carry those dates across into what we know of Roman history and start to identify the political agendas that made people build. And 
as far as I am concerned, London is very much built around those political agendas. We have some stunning dates. Um, so that's, that's what we play with a lot of material, but in particular, some precise dating. And an enormous depth. There's nine meters of stratigraphy in places in London and a vast volume of finds from it. So that's our working material, the stuff from which we can start to rewrite histories of London and of the Roman Empire in, in general. From a historical point of view, London comes onto the scene in 60, 61 AD. And it does so both from the historical sources that's when Tacitus writes about it. That's its first historical reference as a site sacked by Boudicca and her rebels in the revolt of that year. And I'll come on to Boudicca and her rebels in just a second. But by hap well, useful coincidence, that is also the date of our earliest uh, 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 archaeological finds that we can date. Uh, we have very top right hand of this screen. You should see uh, one of the Bloomberg writing tablets this amazing resource of documentation found in the excavations uh, beneath the Bloomberg headquarters building. And here we have a text prepared just after the Bredican Revolt with the address of London written on it, Londinia. Um, so that's when London enters history. It is at that stage a big enough place to be written about, to be attacked by the rebels. When exactly it was created is a slightly more complicated question. How does London come into existence? And its name is from a Celtic place name, probably uh, Londinian in the original. But that place name is probably applied to a natural feature in the landscape. There is no Celtic, no pre-Roman settlement here. Excavations in the city have been intense. And if you look at the larger map in, in here uh, where it says London, uh, and I hope you can see my mouse, but if not, it's the bit that says London in the middle, uh, that, site where the Roman city is established is essentially open land at the time of the Roman conquest. But we do have now good evidence of a series of farmsteads in the area, uh, one probably at Clerkenwell, certainly one at Bermondsey, uh, one at St Martin in the Fields by Trafalgar Square, and another Iron Age site uh, in the southern part of the Northern Iot of Southwark. Um, and if you look at the bottom left of this slide, there is a picture of the very dry looking and unexciting looking uh, gullies with pottery that came out of these Iron Age phases. Um, this coincidentally is the 1970s, 1980s excavations uh, of the site where these lovely mosaics have only just been discovered in re-excavations adjacent uh, just south of, of Borough Market. Um, but in its pre-mosaic phases, uh, this was a late Iron Age settlement site uh, against the River Thames. Um, however, just to go back once, ooh, there we go. There we go. Um, however, what we do know is that London in this area is very much a peripheral area. We have these late Iron Age kingdoms uh, which start minting coins, and from those coin distributions, we have an idea of a major polity uh, to the southwest of London based at Silchester near Reading. Uh, and the circular dotted coins there are the distributions of the elite sites in that area that are probably politically dependent, allied, affiliated in some senses to the kingship established at Silchester. And the same is true of Colchester Camulodunum, where we have Cunobelin uh, and his heirs minting coins, uh, which spread down to and across the Thames, parts of North Kent are within that polity, that, that area of political control. But London itself sits very much on that borderland. And London is likely to have been a frontier site in the pre-Roman Iron Age. And for the very simple reason that the Thames is very hard to cross. It makes a natural frontier. And when you have competing kingdoms in the southeast of Britain, uh, the Thames is, is more likely to be a frontier than a unifying transportation hub. Uh, and so it's Rome that changes that. And the Roman conquest brings about a complete change of the landscape of southern Britain. And that change is brought about uh, as a consequence of conquest. Um, we know that uh, Claudius, the emperor, uh, brings, uh, sends his legions to Britain in AD 43. It's extensively written about in the historical sources because this is a big deal for the Roman Empire. And what we're not sure about is how London fits into that conquest phase model. Until very recently, 
most of the people I work with, most of my colleagues, were very keen to see London as having been a civilian foundation a trading entrepot built on the banks of the Thames, where the merchants who followed in the wake of conquest set up their uh, hub of activities. And this idea goes all the way back to, to Haverfield, writing uh, over 100 years ago, who described London began not at the nod of a ruler, but through the shrewdness of merchants. And this, of course, appealed to people's sense of what the city of London should be about. It's a place of banking, it's a place of commerce, it's that inventivity that gives the city its direction and its purpose. But on the other side, we have an alternative and a competing model, which is that the site of London grew from the place where the Romans had planted a fort. And the fort to city hypothesis was very popular in the period immediately after the Second World War, uh, when it was recognized that Colchester had been uh, reframed as a Roman colony out of a Roman fort. And the same model was applied to other Roman towns in the Southeast. And the idea of the Roman army being this civilizing force, this important power of conquest, appealed to some of the post-imperial models that were still current at that time. Archaeologists engaging with these two competing models looked and looked during the 1970s and 1980s and basically failed to come up with any trace of a Claudian fort. Bits of military equipment, you see some prettier ones on the screen, but those bits of military equipment a fort do not make. We know soldiers came to London to and fro over the decades that followed. Um, and that was there for the situation we were in right up until uh, uh, about 2008. Uh, excavations at a site called the Wallbrook came across these very early ditches. They're certainly Claudian. They contain some late Iron Age finds. That's not conclusive because late Iron Age finds obviously stayed in currency after the conquest. Um, but these ditches were also backfilled very hurriedly and they form a double ditched enclosure. And this is the west side. And I don't know if you can see the top corner of the drawing, but that shows these finds at the Walbrook. But the chap, there's a chap called Ian Blair and during his 40 odd years digging in London, Ian is probably responsible for a good third of the really exciting discoveries in Roman London. If, it, if, it's, if it's a thrill, Ian probably was part of the, 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 the trowel side of finding it. Um, but here, we, and you can just see here the ditch forming part of this double ditched enclosure. And then piecing together other early discoveries of ditches that people hadn't really been able to date or got a sense of, there is now the possibility that we've identified a large Claudian double ditched enclosure on the western side of where the city of London is, centered around uh, the Leadenhall Market area, which is where the Forum was later developed, but primarily driven through its location by the site of London Bridge. And so we have these ditch systems, which let us suggest that there is perhaps a conquest phase fort based here. And this does rather make sense of what we know of the history and topography of the period. The, we know that uh, Aulus Plautius, who led the legions that Claudius sent to Britain, we know that he had pressed on from his landing spot somewhere on the south coast. Uh, my man is on Richborough, but, but there are people who favor Fishbourne. Um, wherever he landed on the south coast, he made for the Thames. Tacitus describes it in detail. Dear Cassius describes it in detail. He made for the Thames, and at the Thames, he forced a crossing. His troops followed the retreating Britons across a bridge and he defeated them and, they, and they, they scarpered. He then waited there for Claudius to arrive so that Claudius could hate, take the glory, could take the plaudits of being the conquering emperor. And so his troops waited in London. Sorry, oh, I've given it away, my conclusion. His troops waited somewhere on the banks of the Thames, and I would suggest in London, for four, five, six weeks in the summer of AD 43. Uh, Claudius arrives. We know he was only in Britain for a, a fortnight, just over a fortnight. He wasn't in Britain long enough to have landed on the south coast and moved all the way over land to Colchester. He had to reach where his troops were waiting for him. We know they were waiting for him on the banks of the, of, of the Thames somewhere. If you look at the later road system, which is shown here in red on this slide, that later road system shows the line of Watling Street coming up through Kent. And if you look at where it hits Southwark, 
It is crossing onto these ayats, these gravel banks that create a pinch point in the river. And this is a clever place to site a bridge. If you look at the, the gray blue color, that's the Thames floodplain. The Thames floodplain would have been marshy, inaccessible, high tides, it would have been inundated, not a sensible place for, for troops to, to wade across in, in alien territory. So we do have a very sensible bridging point at London. I don't have time to say why I dismiss Westminster. Some people have argued Westminster. You can question me about why I think Westminster doesn't cut it. But here we have a sensible bridging point. And I think it is likely that a pontoon bridge was built here, AD 43, therefore reinforcing the suggestion that those ditches we found on the North Bank form the site of the conquest phase four. This is a relatively new revival of an old argument, but is one I press strongly in my splendid book. Um, just for the fun of it, uh, I mentioned this late Iron Age site, this farmstead uh, on near Borough Market. Uh, this is the site where Amancio was later built, one of these administrative buildings, which was also an inn. That's the place these mosaics have been recently been found. Uh, and that is uh, likely to have been in occupation at the time of the conquest. I would love to imagine that the Emperor Claudius arrived in his boats with his siege engines and his elephants, with his additional troops. I would love to believe that it was there at Borough Market he first set foot on British soil and led the Roman legions off to Colchester. It's a bit of fantasy, because of course you can't find his footprints and we can't find his elephants, but it's the sort of site he would have visited. What it does suggest though, is that the place name we've got for London, which is probably, uh, I mean, people argue about what the, the, the Londinian might mean in its origin, but one of the latest suggestions is that it means low-lying land from Celtic lander. And of course, the low-lying lands given to, to this site would suit the soggy south bank better than they would suit the hills on the north bank. We know that Ptolemy later on describes London as a Kentish city. There is a genuine risk and I was born on the north side of the river, and I'm a north side of the river chap, but there is a genuine risk that London's origins actually come from Kent, and we're really a city of Kent after all. My family will never forgive me. Um, so once the fort is there, nothing much happens with it for a while. The whole point of the fort was it was a temporary installation to wait for a few weeks for the emperor. People probably were based people. The soldiers were probably housed in tents. We certainly don't find their buildings. We find no structures associated with them. Although from one poultry, they have found a few little bits of tent leather that I would love to think of are the leftover bits of the conquest phase tents. Um, but those early uh, soldier uh, presence in London uh, move on. And London doesn't really come back into being until five years at least later. Uh, and what we seem to have are two phases of major change going on in London. One of them dates to AD 48, and that is dated by uh, the works on the road system. And if you look where the upper red arrow goes from the one poultry finds, here at one poultry, timbers associated with culverts and drains are dated AD 48 by their felling date. Uh, th those timbers, are pretty essential to creating the drainage system that allows the building of the Roman roads. They sit underneath the first gravels. So those entry roads into the settlement area are dated AD 48, and we have associated activities that suggest something's going on here. It has a central T-junction, it has a graveled area that later became a forum. And I suggest that that might just possibly be a supply base rather than a city. But we have no precise evidence either way. What we do know is that only four years later, it is rapid, radically altered. The plan you see here is the situation in AD 52. And in AD 52, they relay the drainage around the road systems, but they also lay the first waterfront refetments. These at Regis House are dated AD 52, uh, right by London Bridge. And they completely reorganize the street grid. So what you had in its earliest AD 48 plus period is wiped away by a massive replanning exercise where they only keep the main uh, T-junction, the road coming out from London Bridge and the east-west 
uh, decumanus, which I put inverted commas because it's a misuse of the Latin, um, that road uh, is probably retained from the earlier supply base phase. But in AD 52 is when I think they make London into a proper settlement with people being given land grants, being given property plots to develop, and a settlement that attends the needs of the rapidly expanding Roman presence in Britain. The road system is what gives it away. The need for water refetments is what gives it away. The large handling area of gravel surfaces in the Forum is what gives it away. This is a place for marshalling goods. This is a place for getting the supplies on their way to support the armies of conquest, which are, of course, still uh, in the process of moving forward into the Midlands, moving westwards towards Wales. Um, and these uh, early stage developments of London occur at dates which are dendro dated to precise years. And those dendro dates coincide exactly with the dates at which new governors arrived in the province of Britain to take control of the administration. And so there does seem to be this sense that the, the new governor would arrive with an agenda, with that, right, you're now going to be doing some reorganization around X, Y, or Z. And London is seeing the immediate impact of that. People are going out, felling trees in the woodlands around London, uh, soaring up the, 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 tam, uh, the, the planks and building in London uh, as the first stage of new programmed works. Um, and we've got, uh, uh, those developments occurring, and then another occurring in AD 60, we also see the same thing happening again. I don't have a slide of what goes on in AD 60, but the consequence of what goes on in AD 60 is new campaigns being planned in Wales was, of course, the revolt of 60, 61. Um, we know quite a lot now about the rebuilding after that revolt. The London is burned. We have the bright red, fire reddened, destruction of all of the settlement area. And the slide you see now shows what's going on immediately after the revolt. The town center is relayed pretty much on its previous lines, but a fort is planted, found in excavations at Plantation Place in 1999. A fort is planted right in the middle of town. We have these log causeways built, which are probably going to aid and support the movement of troops and other goods around the settled area. Um, and we also have other building works going on. Uh, Regis House, where we had an early, very crude waterfront, you saw the earlier plank and uh, post revetments are replaced by massive waterfront keys, enormous timbers being rafted down river, vast warehouses being built along the quayside, AD 64, precise dating, uh, intriguingly built over some human remains, whether or not these are victims of post-revolt repression, we don't know, but they sit underneath the keys of AD 64. And we also have the building of new bathhouses with their sophisticated waterworks. And this really does look like military engineering. London between AD 62 and 64 is being rebuilt as a strong military presence, uh, military reoccupation. And this is also the period from which we have all these lovely texts at the Bloomberg headquarters building. Uh, if you've not read Roger Tomlin's report, uh, there are some awesome and wonderful insights in in into the, the, the goings on, the business dealings, the military toing and froing, uh, the money lending, the banking that makes London function. And this is all about its role in supply and its role in supporting the administration. Um, Following on in the years after the revolt, we've got uh, these splendid three tombs uh, found around the edges of town. Uh, and this is just to give you a feel for what London's about now. The picture at the bottom is an artist's reconstruction of this early site, this Neronian city. Um, we have the tombstone of the procurator, uh, uh, Classicianus, uh, married into and probably part of uh, uh, a Gallic Belgic family from uh, near Trier um, uh, and his tombstone is one of the highlights of, of discoveries in, in the 30s and 50s in London. We've also got this amazing set of discoveries at Warwick Square. These are in the British Museum and they are some of the most stunning cinnery urns we've excavated ever in Britain. Uh, there's a porphyry urn at the bottom right, that's Egyptian porphyry, 
These sculpted vessels, Simona Pern has done a fantastic paper on these things. These sculpted cinerions are only usually found in direct association with the very highest of uh, officials and the imperial family itself, Egyptian porphyry. And these lead canisters have got these little references to uh, platonic philosophy, the idea of the quadriga, the chariots lifting the soul heavenwards. Um, and these are the sorts of things that could easily have been containing the ashes of some of the highest officials in the Roman province. I suspect even the governor uh, as, as a candidate. But, but whoever it is there, these are, these are typical, in a sense, of the people being based in London, seriously high up officials running the administration with military support, but these are now also running the civilian side of the administration, the procurator running the estates, all of the confiscated lands the emperor was heir to. When you've beaten people, you, 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 you take their property. Um, hence why so many Kentish kings were quick to surrender to Rome and say, no, we're allies, we're allies, don't, don't confiscate. Um, one intriguing difference, and this is a very unusual burial, this on the South Bank in Southwark is a lady buried with a combination of both Iron Age and Roman items. Uh, she has Samian vessels, she has a wine flagon, uh, but she also has a talk and a mirror. Um, she's Neronian in date. Her uh, uh, isotopic analysis of her teeth uh, suggests that she's born in Britain. This is a member perhaps of an aristocracy that had sided with Rome and hence being on the Kentish side of the river could perhaps be associated with one of these farmsteads that we know were, were sitting on the south bank of the river. So, but she's unusual. Most of what we see on the north bank is very Roman. Where we do get native British presence, it is very peripheral. And what we see in terms of burial, material culture, uh, inscriptions, writing, is immigrants. Immigrants supporting the administration, many from Gallia Belgica, but also throughout the Roman Empire. And London keeps that character pretty much through most of the Roman period, this sense of being uh, a place for the colonial administration to run a province from, not a place that attracted or perhaps even allowed many of, of, of the native community to participate. It is an alien city in, in most regards. And we see that also in the way in which very few of the uh, uh, surrounding rural sites around London pick up on the material culture of the Roman period. There are many sites which remain really quite uh, materially impoverished through the early parts of the Roman administration. Uh, and I rather suspect that some of these are uh, the, the, the estates that have been confiscated and are still being run uh, directly from the imperial uh, procurator's uh, household. Um, big changes, and I'm gonna start rushing. I knew I was gonna talk too long. I warned you I was gonna stick to the early stuff mainly. Um, just to say that London sees a slowing down of activity in the late Neronian period. Uh, Nero had other worries, other fish to fry. The civil war is what changes things dramatically. Vespasian uh, wins out at the end of the year of three emperors in AD 69. And Vespasian is a really big player in making London into a much more Roman looking place. Um, and this is partly because Vespasian himself identifies with Britain. He had served on the original campaigns of conquest here, but he also wished to hitch his wagon to the, the glories that Claudius had won by conquering the province. And of course, even greater glory that Caesar had won by first visiting the Britain uh, in, in the first century BC. And so Vespasian sees conquest in Britain as a key to dynastic legitimacy, which of course, he doesn't have through inheritance. He is buying into uh, what the uh, Claudius and uh, Caesar had done. And we see this archeologically in two stunning building programs. I'm only talking to you now about one of them and that's the amphitheater. And the amphitheater is built with timbers that are felled over several years, but in a procurement program that starts AD 70, 71, which is exactly when Vespasian's new governor, Cerealis, arrives to take office. So as we've seen in previous phases, arrival of new governor, and suddenly people are felling trees around London for major construction projects. And in this case, the amphitheater, a really typical symbol of the Flavian dynasty and Vespasian in particular's interest in power. The amphitheater, I mean, we, he built the Colosseum. So what he's doing in Britain is very much uh, 
not the Colosseum, this is a smaller affair, it's a timber built thing, but the strategy is the same. This is about circuses, this is where the emperor's image would have been paraded on days to celebrate the imperial cult. This is also where prisoners and victims would be executed. We always think about the amphitheater as gladiatorial combat. Very expensive to train gladiators and have them accidentally kill each other in combat. Very ritualized, fine for Rome with all its wealth. This is more likely to have been a place for public execution, a place to set wild animals on victims, a place to occasionally have bear baiting, dog fights, those sorts of things. We've actually got quite a few bits of brown bear bone now found in various excavations in London, spilling out from bear baiting going on in the Roman period. So this is a, a big symbol of what Vespasian is on about. Uh, interestingly, the other site where the same things are going on is a new administrative building, a mansio built on the south bank of the river over the site of our later Iron Age settlement site, which is where the mosaics that we, we I've now talked about several times have only just been uh, turned up. Um, here I am, and I've hardly got through the first century. I'm gonna quickly point on the fact that London in the later Flavian period is developed and redeveloped around not just the circus you've seen, but also around bread. Granaries are established, grain is being imported, we've got uh, new warehouse facilities built, and also we've got these wonderful uh, mills now, timber built mills being built on the Walbrook and Fleet rivers. Uh, one was found uh, quite some time back around 1990 in the Fleet Valley. Um, other bits of a timber mill mechanism appear to have been found in the Bloomberg headquarters excavations. And if that is the case, this would date into the 80s, which is when they were rebuilding, uh, uh, redesigning the, sorry, I said 78 to 83 period, when they were uh, canalizing water from the Warbrook, probably serving mill leets that supplied these mills. And these mills had an enormous capacity to mill grain, to make bre bread, we've got bakeries, we've probably got free distributions. And I do think that the early model for London is very much around an Anona form of supply. We all know about the Anona supply of Rome being about the grain feeding of Rome, but the army in Britain also needed its wine, it needed its oil. We have the urban population in London needed feeding, and the mills that we're seeing built do look more likely to be public constructions than uh, commercial enterprises, and the organized distribution to keep food security in this important administrative center uh, looks to have been quite a high priority during this, uh, Flavian period of forward campaigning. And this is all coming in under the governor Agricola, who in AD 83 succeeds in, in defeating the, uh, the, the Scots, or well, the Caledonians then, uh, at the Battle of Mons Graupius, and in theory, uniting Britain into a single uh, governed province. Uh, and that takes up until 83. So that first 40 odd years of London's history is all about expanding provincial control. And I've talked for far too long about that. So I'm going to whistle past the glories of Hadrian. Hadrian, whose head was recovered from the River Thames, his forum, this magnificent creation, which was actually probably started by Trajan. Uh, but Hadrian's peers sees London at its peak. We have uh, fantastic public buildings now being built. But this is also a time of, of, of death and destruction. We have Hadrianic fire. I have recently argued in papers that this Hadrianic fire, which looks to date to the period about 125, 126, and is found on many archeological sites. Here you see at Gresham Street, a building burned in the Hadrianic fire. You can perhaps make out the kitchen uh, bits and bobs uh, in the blackened fire destruction there. Um, the whole city was burned. Uh, that burning was followed by the construction of a new fort, uh, the Cripplegate Fort, usually described as the governor's bodyguards fort, but curious that the governor hadn't needed bodyguard until immediately after the Hadrianic fire. We have the construction of a major new bypass road along the north side of city. We have the building of new keys to improve supply. Uh, and we have a distribution of skulls that I'll talk about in well, Crania, that I'll talk about more in just a second. But all of these uh, features are 
very similar to what we saw after the Boudican revolt when Rome had needed to reestablish its military control of Britain. And so I have argued that the fire destruction of London in the Hadrianic period may actually have been an act of war rather than an accidental fire. And this calls into question the popular image of Hadrian as being uh, a great emperor, built lots of lovely things, uh, cultured, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, he may have been all those things. He was also uh, in charge of some pretty powerful military forces and was pretty quick to suppress rebellion and revolt where it occurred. His Judean wars killed tens of thousands. And there are hints in historical sources and indeed one direct reference, well, two direct references, to warfare in Britain being a problem during Hadrian's reign. So I rather suspect that London may have been burnt to the ground as the consequence of hostile action. And that may also help explain all these Walbrook skulls we get. The River Walbrook is chocker with these river rolled skulls. Some may have rolled out of cemeteries, but altogether about 300 have now been counted in archeological works. Many others have been found in antiquarian discoveries without count. There are almost certainly thousands of these skulls. They do range in date, but the peak skull is Hadrianic. And intriguingly, two out of the four of these skulls that were found uh, reburied in these ditches in excavations for the Elizabeth line, two out of four of these skulls uh, were people who grew up in areas with granitic geologies. You don't find them around London. I love the thought this is from the highlands of Scotland, because of course that's where the Jacobite army was raised and did its best to come to London uh, in, in the uh, 18th century. So there is a sort of, where did these people come from? Not all of them from the North, but perhaps reprisal after the revolt results in mopping up operations and, and a steady flow of people to be slaughtered, exposed, body exposure is a common uh, way of, of uh, that, hurting those who've hurt Rome. After the Hadrianic reoccupation of London, the city sees again uh, some very uh, high investment in high status buildings. We've got uh, townhouses being built in the Antonine period. We've got uh, a, a flurry of temple building in the early Antonine period. This dedication found at Tabard Square on the south bank of the river, uh, a key one uh, in that this is dedicated not by a public official, but it is dedicated by someone who does not identify as a Londoner. This is somebody who is a tradesman with London, uh, a Moritix, Celtic word for people who were bringing goods back and forward from Gaul, uh, but he was a citizen of Northern Gaul, not a citizen of London. And this is typical of the sorts of people who were dedicating things in London and doing things in London. Um, Tiberius Serulianus uh, and a temple here to uh, Mars. Um, and this is one of the temple sites built near the amphitheater. And it's quite likely the amphitheater is actually built next to an earlier temple precinct unadorned with handsome architecture, where they start building these Romana Celtic temples uh, in the uh, course of the second century. And I've done a splendid job about telling you the early development of London. I'm now going to have to summarize in but a few words, the latter part of the talk. And I do apologize for always doing this, but I do love the early period so much. London goes through a massive contraction very shortly after those temples you've just seen were built. Um, we see that in a series of sites which have an interruption to the sequence of buildings. Archaeologists really get obsessed with the detail of the evidence for this because negative evidence is the hardest of all evidence to read. Things not being there is a much harder uh, subject of study. We have this uh, dark earth horizon, which is the product of uh, bioturbation, of roots growing in and worms acting on the soil. But there are sites where we can tentatively suggest that the dating for that is to the 160s, uh, 170s. More to the point, we have a rapid tail off in uh, assemblages with ceramics um, heading into this period of around the 160s. Also, back to our dendro, timber supply continues throughout London's early decades. People chop down wood, repair a drain, chop down wood, build a new pile foundation for a house. And that practice of continually renewing with newly procured timber tails off circa 165 AD. There is a 
period then for nearly 15 to 20 years when new timber is not being procured for construction activity in London. If we measure, as I've tried to do, and this is a still taken from my book, the sites where occupation does look to be interrupted in that 160s period against the sites where we can show continuity, and continuity is there, there is a clear pattern of retraction in the more peripheral parts of town and the more commercial parts of town. There is clear evidence of continuity in higher status buildings, uh, masonry buildings, areas with good water supply along the waterfront and around the forum. Um, I estimate that there could be a contraction by up to two thirds. That is a, perhaps an extreme example. And this potentially is a product of the Antonine Plague. People are very uncertain how serious the Antonine Plague was in the Western provinces. It's mainly documented from the East, but of course the East is where the history was being written. We don't have historians writing about Britain at this point in time. But what we do have in London are two hints of an interest in the Antonine Plague. One is indirect, and that is the arrival of this archer cult. Um, Rafe Merrifield, several decades ago, suggested that the popularity of a cult of an archer who can be identified as Apollo is associated with Apollo's role as the bringer of plague, but also the god who can take plague away, uh, Apollo the archer. And then more recently, uh, we have this discovery of an amulet thrown into the River Thames and found on the Thames foreshore, an amulet which uses a spell to drive away plague. Uh, poor Demetrius was, was uh, concerned to protect himself. And he <clears throat> was making a spell which used words that come out of an oracle uh, that was cast in, in AD 165 against the plague and, and the Oracle of Claros said, use this spell to ward off the plague, it's being used in London. So there does seem to be a case to be made that Antonine plague is one of the reasons why London hits contraction, not necessarily because of mortality, we don't have dead people, but because people do not wish to be based in a densely populated urban center, people vote with their feet at times of a pandemic, um, working at home wasn't quite the option then that it is now, but not working in town was an option. Soldiers perhaps relocated to the Cripplegate Fort, we think maybe abandoned around this time. So those soldiers who'd been moved to London were moved out. You protect your forces by moving to somewhere less at risk, big port city, high risk. And that then changes the dynamic of what can go on in London. Without a big workforce, you can't make the docks work so effectively. You need lots of labor to move grain from ship to land. This is a problem in the second century. London is revived, but not for, until 15, 20 years later, a generation later. And that revival does look to be a renewed military interest in Britain. We've got waterfront construction. And I'm sorry, I know I'm gonna run over time here, but we have a timber dated AD 197, showing the date of major new waterfront constructions. AD 197 is an exact historical date. It is the year in which uh, Clodius Albinus, the usurper based in Britain, who had taken all of his troops across to Gaul, is defeated by Severus in the Battle of Lyon in February of that year. And within months of Clodius Albinus dying at the Battle of Lyon, head put on a spike, paraded in Rome, Severus sends a new general to Britain. And what does his new general, his new governor do? He builds a waterfront on the banks of the Thames. Bang on his arrival. And he's doing that because Clodius Albinus had taken all the troops out of Britain. So you have to redo the whole business of reinforcing the, 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 the architecture of control. And I won't go on now to how the second century and early third century reuse of the waterfront can consistently be related to these programs of military interest in Britain, but it does look to be a pattern that we've established earlier on that is repeated. This is what brings us people like uh, the, the builder of the Temple of Mithras, and we have renewed prosperity in the early third century. And then we have another even bigger shock to London, here, rather than it being measured through the depopulation of sites 
we measure it through the complete abandonment of the port. All that port rebuilding we saw going on uh, around Severus and Clodius Albinus in the early third century comes to a rapid and aggressive halt. And they strip back the timber waterfronts from the port and they make it into what looks like a defensive bank. London's port no longer has any job to serve of importance. You do not need all those keys, all those waterfronts, all those storage facilities. And this is contemporary with a major collapse in long distance trade, Amphora that had been coming in in vast numbers, come in only in small numbers. The Spanish Amphora that had brought oil and wine no longer arrived. It's a smaller number of North African Amphora. And we've got big change going on in the landscape as well. Iron extraction, the wheel seems to decline. We've got, again, a, a ceasing to fell timbers from the, the, the woodlands around London that had been revived in the early third century, now drops off. I've got strong views on the why here. I've put three possible answers out there. They're all of them good ones. They're all of them true ones. The Gallic Empire interrupts communication and trade through the Roman Empire. But I do think the plague of Cyprian is a major factor because the dating of change in London suggested by the dendrochronology is AD 252. That is when people stop importing new timbers to repair things in London and give it a rest for another 15, 20 years. So I do think we have another episode of plague. And if London's dating of change is correct, and this does depend on how much you trust archeologists to have found enough of the timbers going on, but if we trust the archeologists to have found all the timbers that matter, and they must carry on looking, um, 8252 is our watershed date. And that really is exactly when Bishop Cyprian is really getting himself worried in Carthage, beginning to write about this new plague, getting other signs of this plague hitting the Roman Empire. Manpower shortages, people not turning up to work. How do you man your ships? How do you man your uh, iron working sites in the wheel? How do you sustain trade when you don't have the workforce? I think is an important factor in what gets called the third century crisis. You can then go on and say, how can you man your frontiers when you are suffering from reduced manpower? Why is it people are crossing frontiers in these dates? It's not to say there weren't frontier problems earlier on, but why are these the dates at which those frontier problems become a big deal in Gaul and we start getting the Franks coming across and then we get Frankish piracy. Is this a product of, of the problems of keeping uh, the fleets together, of keeping uh, London together? Question mark, question mark, question mark. I'm now gonna skip the fact that even after that ghastly plague, London is reestablished. Um, we get late, activities, perhaps again relating to episodic periods of military attention, uh, barbarian conspiracy, maybe a factor in the decision to put bastions around London's town walls. Uh, we've got some quite intriguing late Roman burials. Uh, the chap you see at the top right there was buried uh, with the uh, insignia of a high official, usually, but not always military officials. Um, uh, Again, perhaps dating to this 360s, 370s, we've got some very interesting dating coming out of that burial. Um, but those episodic periods of revival, written about in historical sources, become a, a little bit fewer. The later period in, in London's history is to do with traffic the other way, where we get usurpers taking control of Britain and then moving troops from Britain to pursue their campaigns in Gaul. And that I would suggest starts to influence the archeology span we get at the back end of the fourth century. And that back end change dates as early as the 380s. Uh, you remember earlier on, I was talking about these culverts taking water uh, from uh, springs alongside the road at One Poultry. Well, here we are at One Poultry looking at one of the latest culverts. They've maintained good drainage here all the way from AD 48 through to circa AD 380 but then this is disused. So whatever's happening with the uh, water further upstream, it's no longer being managed further downstream. A decapitated skeleton is thrown into uh, the disused culvert. Um, we've also got these hordes coming up in se several wells, again dated to the 380s, 385 period. Those hordes are the product of people having feasts. We've got the other feasting materials in there. A big party, 
And are these the parties of abandonment? You're closing the well, you're leaving the property. Are people actually beginning uh, to move out of London? Is this the sort of thing that's going on as the high administrators of the city are moving back across to, to the continent uh, following uh, their new uh, leaders, the usurpers who, who are attempting to seize control of, of the empire as a whole? Question mark. What we do know is that holes are being dug in the roads to London Bridge, holes are being dug in the road to the bridges across the Walbrook in this 383 90s. So London isn't abandoned, but people no longer think that ox carts are going to regularly be going along those roads because the pits they're digging to extract gravel leave behind something that would not easily cope with major traffic. So London is no longer a place of traffic of any scale. And there are other things in the equation. So London is ceasing to be a place that matters well before, I say it is a place that matters nominally. London ceases to be a place that has a dynamic that it had before, well before the end of the supposed Roman period at the beginning of the fifth century. And what we get at the fifth century after Rome is, and it, sorry, is looks to be effectively an evacuation of the, uh, instruments of command that had sustained life in London after its role as a trading place centre had diminished. And those instruments of control, treasury, government officials, does seem to uh, no longer have a presence. And we see little continuity going on within the walled area into the fifth century. But we do see the countryside around, those little black squares representing where fifth century finds come from, outside the walled area. And in particular, continuity at sites such as our farmsteads, which had become villas, uh, sarcophagus, and the site at St. Martin the Fields is our strongest case for continuity uh, through the, into the fifth century. Uh, Bermondsey Abbey could be another, Clerkenwell could be another. Intriguingly, the very sites that were late Iron Age centers of farming, perhaps the remaining centers of farming activities around the walled area. So London, even though the administration is no longer using London because the administration has turned its attention elsewhere, withdrawn from the Northwest, the people who farmed the lands are perhaps still prospering in certain locations, perhaps even prospering a bit better because they're no longer having to pay quite so much in tax and they can get on with looking after themselves. And these chaps at St. Martin the Fields are still putting together kilns to make new tiles, perhaps for the roofs on villa buildings um, from which these sarcophagi are gener being generated at the back end of the fourth and into the early fifth century. So continuity, until then we see Saxon London developing and I can't talk about Saxon London because I'm a Romanist and I've gone on too long anyway. But those are my key bullet points. I'll leave those up for a second just in case anyone wants to read the core of my argument. Um, but I'm not going to say it because otherwise you won't have time for questions. And I've talked too long. Apologies. Mike, do I surrender the floor to you? Oh, and thank you, by the way. Thank you.